So today, if you want to title, it's Iran or Iran in prophecy. It's interesting as you as we look through the the Bible, you go, well, how much could there possibly be about Iran in prophecy? And we actually find that there is a considerable amount, in fact, almost too much to even cover for today. So we'll give it uh, a good going over for sure, but it won't be. Uh, a compendium, as it were, of the subject. First off, I think it behooves us to know exactly who Iran is in the Bible. You know, the names of people in the Bible have changed throughout the years as they moved around and they've taken on different names, but Iran was also known as Persia. And Persians, again, are the people of Iran, and in fact, I remember one time a guy came in for an interview, and it was during the days of... Uh, the uh, all the um, captured Americans over in Iran and he was applying for a job and he said you know whenever my boss asked him where he was from he said Persia and at the time I had no idea I'm going oh, that sounds kind of cool though but then after he left my boss told me what Persia was and that it was actually Iran I go oh okay so he didn't want to know but the Iranians identify as Persians even to this day and they're proud of that heritage and uh, even the name of the language, they typically we call it Farsi, but they'll call it Persian, and that's the language that they speak. So there is a definite connection that is well recognized. Now, one that's a little bit more tenuous is the name of Elam, E L A M. And that's the way we'll pronounce it today, anyway. Mostly, I'm sure it's somewhat different in the Hebrew, and probably yet different again by the the Elamites of the of that era, but. Even Elam is recognized as a portion of Iran today. In fact, it's situated, ancient Elam, was situated just on the east side of the Persian Gulf in the southwest side of Iran, modern-day Iran, and it extended up north from there to uh, perhaps what you would call western uh, Iran today. But those peoples eventually, as they uh, grew and overcame and became bigger, moved uh, eastward, and they moved eastward through Iran, even all the way to parts of India. Now, even in India today, you find some peoples called the Parsi, and and again, you know, I'm going to say it that way, it's spelled P-A-R-S-E-E -E in, in terms of our language anyway, but again, very uh, it's a, a derivation of the word Persian, and these people were people that are recognized as having left Iran and uh, migrated over towards India. Some of them left for you know one reason or the other, whether it was because of expansion or because of religious freedom or whatnot. But nonetheless, you still find today in Iran uh, provinces that are called uh, Elam, or they spell it I-L-A-M. But nonetheless, all these things, the point is, are fairly well established. Even from a worldly point of view, you can go look it up on Google or Wikipedia and it readily says that these people are the modern-day Iranians. So Persia, Elam, and Iran, you can think of as basically being the same peoples. In Daniel 8 and verse 2, we can see it in the Bible as well. Daniel 8 and verse 2. Of course, this is Daniel speaking. And it's about a vision that he happened when he was at a certain place. Daniel 8.2 says, I saw in the vision, and it, so it happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river, and so on. But the point is, is that he was in Shushan, the citadel. Now, a citadel is kind of a fortified area of a city. In fact, I think Citadel just means small city, but it's kind of like the last stand in an area whenever perhaps you're being invaded by foreign forces, that when they come in, it's the Citadel. Well, Shushan was the Citadel in the province of Elam. Well, Shushan was one of the, uh, well, I won't get into that just yet, but uh, nonetheless, you see that Shushan, which is one of the cities today in modern day Iran, uh, they call it either Shush, just S-H-U-S-H, -S -S or Susa, S-U-S-A. 
which is where these ancient ruins are, and they've supposedly been there for the last 5,000 years, according to carbon dating. So it, it does put these people of Elam back there uh, a very, very long time ago. Now look at Esther 1, 1 through verse 3. We'll also see, and we'll make this other equation too. So we see that that Elam, the province of Elam, is in modern-day Iran. We we'll also see what it was known as back then. In Esther one and verse one, now it came to pass in the days of Hazarus. Okay, and this is more of a title than a name, because this this Ahasuerus, this guy here, was probably Xerxes. If he was not Xerxes, then he was Artaxerxes or Cambyses. He's one of the three, but most people think he was Xerxes here. And this is the one that went on to marry Esther, who was a Jew. Nonetheless, um, it says that this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. So it's talking about the scope of the empire here. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of this kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all the officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles, the princes of the provinces being for him, before him. So here we find that this was the seat of power for the Medo-Persian Empire, right? which was in Elam, Right, which was that province, which is modern-day Iran. So the Iranians, Elamites, the Persians, all the same people in that area. And it's so it tells you right there from Ethiopia, if you know your geography, all the way over to eastern to India was the range of this empire. And, of course, going through the Iranian area there. So what we have then is that the people, the spreading of these people, at this time in that area and these people were the Medes and the Persians and of course those two people were together now it's interesting in Genesis 10 22 that we see who Elam was in Genesis 10 and verse 22 and you can just write it down as part of the genealogies but it says the sons of Shem were Elam Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram so Elam was the son of Shem. So basically, and uh, this is the interesting part, is that Shem is the, where we get the term Semite from. Mm -hmm. right? So whenever they talk about the, you know, somebody being uh, against the Jews, that they're anti-Semite or they're anti-Semitic, it comes from this term, is that they're anti-Shem. Okay? And it just so happens that Elam was his son and that the that means that makes the Iranian people Semites or you know people just like the Jews in terms of their uh, lineage so it's interesting also that as I mentioned before that the Persian king ended up taking Esther a Jew a Jewess as his wife in the story of Esther and you know that's a, a very interesting part and of course she played a very big part in saving the Jews of her day at that time that were in the uh, Persian and Median Empire and of course saved them from being wiped out by Haman so the point is is that Iran or the the Elamites at this time were getting along with the Jews and you'll see that throughout history they actually did do that a lot and there was also we'll get into the parts where they weren't but even recently you know, this might be hard for some of our, our younger people to understand or to see, but Iran was getting along with the Jews under the uh, under the leadership of the Shah of Iran. It wasn't so bad then. But then when the Ayatollahs came in, so you had Ayatollah Khomeini and now Khomeini, it's a completely different world. And we, again, I'm, I'm not sure what Iran connotes in everybody's mind, but right now, Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map. Of course, they'd love to wipe the U.S. off the map, who they consider to be the great Satan as well. But the point is, is that they are actually very closely related in terms of a genealogy, bloodline, and, and whatnot. Now, 
wanted to make an example of one of these, um, one of the more amazing prophecies that concerned a Persian. And it also concerned the salvation or the, uh, I guess, repatriation of the Jews at the time. In fact, it's a, this prophecy is so unbelievable in much of the world's terms that they have to go and redate Isaiah. They're saying, this could not have been prophesied so far in advance that this was actually true, that they called out somebody by name who would come much, much later. Let's turn to that in Isaiah 44, verses 24 through 28. Isaiah 44, verses 24 through 28. And we'll see some principles here along the way as well. But Isaiah is it's considered to have been written somewhere between 740 and, say, 686 B.C. All right, so, again, we're going backwards from 740 to 686. And I always kind of use the 700 as a round number to figure out certain things that were written in Isaiah. But... Because the events that were prophesied did not happen until 539 B.C., you're looking at a, a scope of uh, how many years is that? You know, between, say, 686 and 549. Is that 130? And then you have 200 plus on the other end. So, again, understand, too, okay, that it's picking a leader out by name that far in advance. Let, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's only 130, 140 years that he had to pick it ahead of time. Okay, by comparison, you know, we just recently had a presidential election and most of the country and most of the world couldn't pick the leader out just a day in advance. Most everybody thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Most everybody thought they couldn't even predict that Trump was going to win. And yet Trump won and they couldn't predict that one day in advance. So how much more awesome is it to pick this out more than 100 years in advance and call it by name? So Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. Okay, so God's very intimately involved in the lives of people from a very uh, early time, much more early than most people even realize. He says, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers, the drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backwards, makes their knowledge foolishness. You know, they can, he's talking about all these, uh, you know, pagan or satanic ways in which, you know, perhaps they actually have a, a, a foot into the satanic world and they might be getting help from demons and whatnot. But, you know, even if they were, God can just go, oh, no, that's not going to be true anymore. And so he can frustrate them to any degree that he wants to. Because they are not true, and the things that they say are not for sure. Now, he goes on talking about himself in verse 26. Who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers? So when God sends a prophet, or he sends a messenger, or he sends a servant, and they say these words, the words that he gave them to say, he is the one who makes it come true. So in the case of Isaiah, Isaiah is writing these things down well ahead of time. And God says, I'm going to make them come true. And he goes, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of Judah, you shall be built. And I will raise up her waste places. And we'll address that in the last verse here of what we're talking about. Who says to the deep, be dry and I will dry up your rivers. Again, and that right there is a possible allusion to uh, a little bit more that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Who says of, and this is where he calls him out by name. Okay, this is Isaiah saying it by inspiration of God. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. All right, so what he's saying here, and you have to understand the context, is that Jerusalem did not need to be built, and the temple was still standing already. And so they're looking at this and going, well, why would you need to say that? Why would you? Why would Cyrus, whoever this Cyrus is, why would he 
who you're calling his shepherd, all right, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too. He says, why are you why are you saying that the temple is going to be built and and this guy is going to be the one that you're going to use to do all this stuff when it's all still standing? So not only does he call out Cyrus by name, but he also is going to say that this guy is going to be instrumental in Jerusalem being rebuilt and the temple foundation being laid again. Now it's interesting. Now according to a historian, I'm going off record here, when I say off record, off the biblical record, so we take it for what it's worth, but a historian back in the day, back in, uh, um, I want to say about the 4th or 5th century BC, he, he relayed the story of what happened in the days leading up to this happening, and he was saying that one of the kings, one of these future kings at this point in time in Isaiah, of the Medes had a daughter, and that he had given in marriage to a Persian, so it's a this kind of putting together of the Medes and Persians as they used to do by, by marriage. But there was a Persian aristocrat, so they're trying to marry in the families and whatnot. Well, anyway, he gave her to be married, and they were. And then this son of the king at the time had a dream. And in his dream, he saw that her child, his daughter's child, would actually raise up, grow up, and take over from him. Would actually... Uh, again, again, the connotation was usurp him or a coup or overthrow him. So he, then this, this one future king, he wasn't a king at the time that he had this dream, apparently. He said, okay, when this child was born, this son, he sent one of his servants to kill the child. Well, the servant could not do it. And so he got this other cattleman, said, hey, I want you to do it. You go kill the son of the, you know, again, she was a, probably a princess in, in many respects, the princess's daughter. Well, this cattleman actually had just had a child and it was stillborn. So instead of killing the child, he took the child and raised the child as his own. Well, it comes out that about 10 years later, they find out that the, the king, I think he's probably king by this time, finds out that the child was of his dream, it must have been a very real dream at the time, was not killed at birth. But now he's 10 years old, and so now he thinks better of this fact that he should uh, kill a 10-year-old royal child. And so instead, he takes it out on that initial servant that he had asked to go do the job, and he kills his son. And as the story goes, served him up as a meal to this servant, which was, again, one of the most evil, horrible things that you can imagine. Well, this servant then at that point vowed that he would get even with the king some way, somehow. And so what does he do? He goes and he convinces the boy, who was named Cyrus, to throw a coup against the grandfather, which he did. And so in the end, it all came to fruition exactly kind of like the dream was. So my suspicion is that the, the dream was not of God, but it was of Satan. But nonetheless, because he went and did this, because the, the king at the time you know, tried to kill him, it all came all the way back around and was fulfilled anyway. It was fulfilled in that way. And so the point is that, you know, that we take from this, you're going, well, God is obviously in charge. He is the one that motivated and said, we're going to make sure that these things happen in these ways because I prophesied it. So now, back to Isaiah 45 in verse 1, which again is a continuation from where we left off in 44. But Isaiah 45 in verse 1, he continues with this prophecy about Cyrus and what Cyrus would do. He says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, so he's calling Cyrus, who was a Persian, right? He, uh, um, that he was going to be his anointed one, his shepherd, as it were, to do these things, which is interesting because Cyrus worshipped pagan gods yeah, and throughout his life. He was not a man of God, per se. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Cyrus knew about his place in history and some of these things. And as we'll see later, he understood to a large degree that God was working in his life. He says, to the Lord, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, 
to subdue nations before him, loose the armor of kings, and to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. And then verse 4, this is for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by name. I have named you, Cyrus, though you have not known me. So even though you did not worship me, or you know, I was not your God in that respect. So this allusion to the, the double doors and the drying up of the river in the previous chapter is talking about how Cyrus would then, because you know, he's already becoming a this great, if I could say, general slash king, when he took over the kingdom from his uh, father, grandfather, and he continued to expand it. As we saw, you know, it, it became a, a, one of the, again, I think we know, it's one of the image, a part of the image of Daniel. It's the second, it's the, the silver, right? First head of gold was Babylon, then the uh, Medo-Persian Empire was the, the chest of silver, right? So it was one of the, the next world-ruling Gentile empire that was going to come onto the scene after Babylon. Well, Babylon was this incredible because of the gold signified such a great quality type of world-ruling empire at the time that many said Babylon was impregnable. Some say that the walls were 80 to 100 feet thick at the base. And there are also these, and, and maybe it was hyperbole, but they said that it may have been as high as 300 feet. But nonetheless, it was for all intents and purposes in its day and time impregnable. And that wasn't the only wall. They had, I think, a moat in between and then another wall. And so here you have to come up against it with bows and arrows, basically, and maybe you have a, a catapult or a trebuchet or whatever. And, and, and this is what you have to fight. A city that is completely surrounded by this kind of wall and can survive a siege for years because it's, it's a city. You know, they, they can grow their own stuff and they can continue to thrive and do the commerce well and they also had the river euphrates flowing through it so they had a, a water supply that went in there too so when cyrus came up to babylon to take it up it was going to be an incredibly daunting <coughs> task that you're just going man how can you even do this if you can do it within you know, several years well the fact of the matter is that it fell in a day because what happened was he diverted the Euphrates River off into some lowlands and the level of the whole Euphrates River dropped and he paid off a spy to open up some of the gates. And again, that's what we're talking about, the double gates that it talks about in Isaiah 45.1. The double doors were open to him and they walked through the river Euphrates and they said it was only like mid-thigh in terms of height. And they went into the into Babylon in the early hours, and by sunrise, Babylon had fallen. And it had fallen to Cyrus, just as prophesied all those years ahead of time. Well, so now, if we recall the story, Babylon had uh, the Jews in captivity. And so, again, they were going to remain in captivity as long as Babylon remained a, a, a power. Isaiah 45 and verse 13. It says, I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all of his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. So here it is. It's prophesying that, okay, once he takes over Babylon, that he would then let his people go, let them repatriate into Israel, and he would do it for, and let them rebuild the city, and he would not require anything of them. He would not say, oh, you need to give me money for doing this, or you need to, you know, X, Y, or Z. And so we find that it was prophesied well ahead of time. And we see a fulfillment in 2 Chronicles 36, 22, and 23. 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 36, 22, and 23 talks about what happened. If you want to put it as a side note, Ezra 1 verses 1 through 4 also talks about it there. But 2 Chronicles 36, 22 says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, okay, now who is it? We're talking about him in terms of him being one of the uh, predecessors to modern day Iran, right? 
that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, Persia, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, you know, according to the Medes and the Persian, the law, it was so let it be done, you know, as it was written and said. He says, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given to me. So Cyrus, this is the part I was talking about, recognized God's part in all of this. And that God was the one who has raised up kings and kingdoms and brought them down. And he commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Right, so here it is, the proclamation, or the, the prophecy, being fulfilled in this proclamation. Right, Build him a house, in other words, the temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So let him go up to Jerusalem, rebuild the city, and rebuild the temple. And so the point of this is, again, as we're going through this, is that there was actually a, a decent relationship, as there should have been, between Iran, or Persia, Elam, Elamites, and the Jews at that time, because obviously Israel had gone into captivity earlier with Assyria, who Babylon took over. Now, let's fast forward to the end time. <coughs> Ezekiel 27 and verse 10, and I can read it to you since it's just one verse, but this is a chapter about the great Tyre, T-Y-R-E, and we read, again, that about the Babylonian system in this chapter, chapter 27. And of course, the Babylonian system is the beast power. And in that, it goes through and talks about how great Tyre was. In verse 10, it says, Those from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. They hung shield and helmet in you, and they gave splendor to you. So he's talking about how great the beast power was, and how awesome all the things that it had. And one of the things it mentions in passing is that the Persians are working with the end-time beast power. Now let's turn over to Isaiah 22 in verse 1. We'll see it a little more in depth. Isaiah 22, verses 1 through 12. We'll skip around a little bit towards the end. <clears throat> so now we're seeing what's coming about today. Now we're coming to see the Iran that we all know. The one that we've been hearing about in the news Okay, the one that you, you see all the time and you go, okay, yeah, you wouldn't want to cross them or be in their line of sight, right? Isaiah 22 verse 1 says, the burden against the valley of vision. So he seems to be saying of Jerusalem here that you don't see things clearly. You're sitting in a valley, right? What, do, what can you see from a valley except, you know, the walls of the hills or mountains around you and that's it. You don't see what's really going on. He goes, what ails you now that you have all gone up to the housetops? You who are full of noise, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Your slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. All your rulers have fled together. They are captured by the archers. All who are found in, in you are bound together. They have fled from afar. Therefore, again, we're obviously talking about end time stuff here. Therefore, I said, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. Do not labor to comfort me because of the plundering of the daughter of my people. Verse 5, for it is a day of trouble and treading down and perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision in Jerusalem, breaking down the walls and crying to the mountain. So he's saying times like these are going to come upon you. Okay, this is what's coming on in the day of trouble. And again, that should kind of hearken up the day of Jacob's trouble. You put Jeremiah 30 verse seven in your notes there, but it's talking about a day of Jacob's trouble you know, that there's none going to be like it. And, but, you know, in the end, you'll be saved out of it. But nonetheless, this is a future time. Now, verse 6. It says, Elam bore the quiver. Now, who's Elam? Yeah, modern day Iran. Elam bore the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen and Kir uncovered the shield. Now, it's interesting that the way that it says it, it says that, that Elam bore the quiver. You know, it's kind of like says, almost like they're helping out. To me, that's a connotation. It could be that 
okay, they're just they're they're carrying their own quiver to do their own damage, but it almost looks like they are bearing this quiver for someone else, which may very well fit into what we'll talk about here in just a little bit too. So, of course, that could be you know who in the end time, none other than the beast power. Now it's interesting. I'll just mention in passing in the literal version, it doesn't say Elam; it says Persia. It says, and Persia lifted the quiver. So again, I just want to reinforce that this is a common understanding that Elam, Persian, and Iran are all basically the same peoples. So now con continuing in verse 7, <clears throat> it says, It shall come to pass, all right, so it's still yet in the future, right? That your choicest valley shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. He removed the protection of Judah. So God, who raises up and brings down, says, okay, Judah, or modern day state of Israel, I am not going to protect you anymore. I mean, you have to look at Israel right now. They're right up against the sea. They're a small little nation. And 99% of the other people in the region hate them to the point that they just want to push them into the sea. They want to kill them. They don't want them to be a part of that region at all because they're the only ones that are considerably different. In other words, they are Jews and everybody else around them are Muslim. You know, now, there are different types of Muslims. That's a whole other story. But nonetheless, here they are, 1% of the population over there, and I'm talking figuratively. I don't know exactly how much it is. But they're just a very small portion of the number of people over there and they're being protected by God until God's timing comes into place. So he says, he removed the protection of Judah. You looked in that day. So he's talking about Judah. And again, a reference here to the end time, in that day, this future time, to the armor of the house of the forest. So again, it's talking about an armory that Solomon had put up and that they were going to rely on their own might, their own weapons. And you know, when you think about it, if you look at modern day Judah, the state of Israel, that that's exactly what they do now. You know, they have not kept to the path. They are not following God. Okay, they are becoming more and more secular. You know, when you have to talk about Jews a lot of times, you have to talk about the secular Jews versus the Orthodox Jews because the secular Jews don't even believe in God a lot of them and they're moving on as they have always done in the past towards or I should say how about away from God towards everything else and so here it is God removes it because they are looking to rely upon themselves to be able to defeat the whole rest of the world that wants to push them into the sea now skipping down to verse 11 you also made a reservoir between the two walls for the wafer of the for the sorry for the water of the old pool, but you did not look to its maker. So again, the point that we were just making, you know, they're relying on their own might and not God. Nor did you respect for him who fashioned it long ago, and in that day, okay, the Lord of God of hosts called for weeping and for mourning and for baldness and girding of the sackcloth. He wanted repentance. He wanted you to change your ways, and then he would take care of you. He would protect you. But they did not do it. And because of that, now, we're seeing that Iran is wants to go into cahoots with the beast power. And we know that the beast power, Daniel talks about it, is going to come against the Holy Land. But now we see that Iran is going to be a part of that army. So it could be that they are mer mercenaries, is the reason why they're going over there, because hey, you're going to go against Jerusalem. We're all for that. We'll help you. We'll send a contingent over, whatever. But Ezekiel 27 says that Persia was part of their army. Now, Isaiah 11, verse 11, I won't spend a lot of time on that because I think we've gone over it a couple times. But what we see that after Iran and the beast power go against Jerusalem, that Iran hold some of the slaves captives. Now, we've talked about the uh, this captivity many times and the exodus from it, but what we see here is that some of, not all of, 
the captives, some of them will go to Iran. It says, it shall come to pass in that day, again, this future time, the day of the Lord, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. This is the second exodus that we've talked about. And he says, who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. So now when we read Elam, what do we read? What do we see? We see, again, the captives coming from all of these places, but for the purposes of today, we see that they're coming out of Iran. So Iran's participating in the war against them and now is holding them captive. And typically when you have a slave, free labor, you treat them like a slave. And you're not going to be treating them in a nice manner, in a Christian or godly manner for sure. Now, Jeremiah 49 then talks about the fact that Elam will have its judgment. And this always happens when we look through the Bible, and I think we more, we've more or less talked about this in, in relation to Syria, uh, Assyria, that because Assyria is a rod of God, and, you know, is an instrument of his anger, that Assyria always goes too far. And because of it, there's going to be judgment on them for doing going way above and beyond what God wanted them to do. And the same is going to be true about Iran here. Uh, Jeremiah 49, verse 34 through 39. Jeremiah 49, verses 34 through 39. It says, the, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, okay, so this is, it dates it there in terms of the reign of Zedekiah. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. So again, he, he, again, bow is a, a, a symbol of war. It's one of the weapons of war. But it's, again, like Judah or Israel was doing at that time, they were relying on their own might. Or at that, again, I say at that time, at this time in the future. Again, Elam is doing the same thing, Iran, that they're relying on that and they're using it and they're just going too far. He says, against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four corners of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. So again, this is going to be an incredible scattering because you say, you know, there are going to be some of these in, in basically all the nations of the world. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. Again, this is all under the auspices of the judgment of God. My fierce anger, says the Lord, I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. And to me, this harkens to that day of great wrath, if you want to put Revelation 6, 17 in there. Again, that's the end of the six seals. And it, call, it says, for the great day of his wrath has come, who is able to stand? So that's at the very end of the six seals, which means the seventh seal is the day of the Lord. And this is this time of great wrath, this great day of his wrath, this fierce anger that God is going to show. And he says, I will set my throne. Okay, now what we're talking about here is for in this context is a timing. Okay, he says, I will set my throne in Elam and I will destroy from there the king and the princes. So when did that happen? That has never happened. Not in this sense. You can always, you know, stretch it to mean this or stretch it to mean that, and I just really don't see it. But what we have in this context is this future time that this is going to happen. When Christ returns and whenever he sets his throne on the earth and the kingdoms of this world become his kingdoms, and nobody else is going to rule in the way that they want to rule. God says, at that time, okay, I'm coming here and I'm going to subdue all nations. You know, flatten the mountains, as it were. In, you know, the, the other aspect of this too is that, you know, you look at Elam or all the way till today and you go, when, when did God actually rule there? You know, did he rule in terms of, you would say, the, the Medo-Persian Empire? No, not really. I mean, Cyrus understood this, but Cyrus still worshipped pagan gods. They were a pagan people. This 
empire was a Gentile empire, was not a godly empire. And so has it has continued throughout the centuries and to today where we know it's Muslim and the Muslims do not worship the same God. He does not worship the God of the Old and New Testament. And it's interesting too because uh, it, it's kind of fascinating that there is a prince of Persia. I don't know if in uh, Daniel 10 verse 13 it talks about that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days and behold Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So Michael, obviously one of the good angels, had to come help uh, this angel, which was probably Gabriel, at that time because the prince of Persia, this was the ruler of Persia, the influence of Persia is this demon. And so during the all these centuries, of course, you know, demons don't die, it's been this influence in the history of Iran and all that they have done. So it has never been a godly nation. And God has never had his throne there in terms of ruling. So I think when we look at it, it seems pretty clear that this is an end time prophecy. For sure, that these two verses, this one and the next one that I'm about to read. But it seems to be that this whole uh, section is talking about that time. And that it appears that Elam, this judgment was going to come on to them. They were going to be scattered to the four winds. Now, continuing in verse 39, it says, It shall come to pass in the latter days. So again, we're still talking about the future. And it says, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Now, this is what everyone needs to understand all the time in the Bible. right? And this goes back to the way that God's plan of salvation is working out. And that is that this is not the only day of salvation. Everyone tends to believe that this is it. That you it's your make or break time. That God is calling everybody at this time. And it's a battle between him and Satan. And it looks like God is losing. Because you have you know all the atheists throughout Asia. And you have Islam, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, quote unquote. And you go say, okay, well... These are all mutually exclusive religions. They cannot all be right. So if only one of them's right, it means that the large, the largest share of all the rest of the people in the world are not doing what is right, and they therefore they're going to hell. Well, that's not the case. God is working things out, and He's bringing people about, and He's going to give everyone a chance, a single chance, to either accept or reject God. And you see, even after all that Iran has done, all that Persia has done, or Elam, whoever you want to call them here, and all that they have done against God's physical people, that he is going to gather them and give them their first chance. And this is what it says here. It says, I'm going to bring back the captives. Okay, so after they have been punished, after they have learned their lesson, I'm going to bring them back. And so, again, we see God's great mercy. We see his great plan in all of this. So now, then, <laughs> it seems that Iran just never learns their lesson. All right? Let's go to Isaiah 21. Because after Iran helps the, um, the beast power to attack Judah, okay, or modern-day state of Israel, and all this stuff happens... It seems as though that this stuff is going to be brought upon Iran by the beast power. It looks like the beast power is going to turn on Iran. All right? And it looks like, because it doesn't come in, out and specifically say, as far as I can tell, who it is that's going to scatter them to the four winds. But it stands to reason that it would be the beast power who's going to be the most significant military power in the world at that time. But this is after the you know, the Iranians have helped them to do this. And of course, that's not unprecedented because if we go back to the ancient times and you have Assyria who's putting uh, Judah into, or not Judah, uh, modern day Judah, I would say, Israel at the time into captivity, well, it was the Babylonians who then went and conquered the Assyrians. And who helped about the Babylonians at that time to conquer Assyria? Well, it was the Medo-Persian Empire. They had helped them. They helped Babylon to defeat Assyria 
thereby making Babylon the premier power in the world at that time. Well, after they had helped them, and after Babylon no longer needed their help, Babylon turned on the Medo-Persian Empire and started fighting them. And so, you know, so much, you know, thanks for all the help. So it's not unprecedented then for the Persians in the future to be turned on by the Babylonian Empire. And it could very well be that they were the ones who scattered them in this way. Well, now who do you think is going to step in and help the Persians? Well, none other than the Medes. So now Isaiah 21 and verse 1, and we'll read, I think, through verse 9. It says, the burden against the wilderness of the sea, again, another name for Babylon there, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it comes from the desert, from a terrible land, a distressing, a distressing vision is declared to me. The treacherous dealer deals treacherously, and the plunderer plunders. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media. All of its sighing I have made to cease. So who do we have? Who is Elam? They're the Persians. And Media? The Medes. So here we have now this prophecy saying that the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, are going to come together again and go against none other than Babylon. And again, it stands to reason that if Babylon turned on them, that, it, that Iran would seek to, you know, their vengeance, as it were, to go against uh, Babylon. And none other than media would help them. Now, I should, I guess, insert here that Med the Medes were the people, okay, in the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire, fled through, north out of Iran, going through, the, between the two seas, up towards what is modern-day southwest Russia and eastern Ukraine. Okay? Probably should have brought up the map to make that a little more obvious. But it's not that far. It's, it's so, kind of surprising whenever you look at uh, Iran that when you go up through that passage, and again, uh, it's other people have fled through that passage in the past as well, but that it's not that far from Iran to um up to Ukraine. Now back to Isaiah 21 and verse 3. It says, let me see how much time we have here. Okay, I might just skip over some of these things. You can go back and read it. The significant part is further down. In fact, let's just go ahead and skip that all and go all the way down to verse 9. So here we are talking about O Elam besiege and O Media. And somebody said, well, that means that's what they did back then. That's what, again, the Medo-Persian Empire were the ones who took over the Babylonian Empire. But in verse 9, we see the duality that is given for us about prophecy. And it's a key to understanding uh, prophecy as well, is that prophecy is often dual in nature. Some people want to say, oh, it means just this. And other people say, oh, it's no, it's just the future. And, and so what they don't understand is that it can actually be the past and the future. And it's a key to, it's an incredible key and a significant key to understanding prophecy because people will go back through some of these things and say, no, that already happened. That's all done. It doesn't mean anything. But what we see in verse 9, it says, look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. Then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And so that's not just poetic. It's prophetic. It says, And all of her carved images of her gods he has broken to the ground. What it means is that Babylon, in this way, will fall twice. Right? So we have the precedent back in 539 B.C. when the Medo-Persian Empire came in and took it down in, again, a, a day, as according to the, the history of the, the victors anyway, that it fell then. But now... Isaiah is saying it falls again. Well, again, you're going, well, hey, you know, that's just that's just prophetic. Well, put Revelation 14.10 in your notes. Wait, is it 14.10? I 
Timothy. I know 18.2 is one of them. So put 18.2 in your notes. I don't have the other one in chapter 14 at my fingertips here. But 18.2, and, and, and I think it's also in chapter 14 as well. He says, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. So now here we are, Revelation, hundred, which is written around 100 AD. And you have this revelation that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, yet in the future. So it's saying, okay, it's going to happen again. It happened once, and now it's going to happen again. So we see then the context of Isaiah 21, when he says, is fallen, is fallen, refers to the Medes and the Persians coming together against this Babylonian system, which I should, I guess, reiterate is the beast power, which is a German-led coalition of ten nations or groups of nations in Europe. And so, and again, we've talked about that at great length. Now, if we go back to, again, if while we're in Revelation, you might want to just put the notes down or go back and look at it later. But you have the seals, the trumpets, and then the plagues, right? The seventh seal is composed of seven trumpets, and the seventh trumpet is seven plagues. Well, the fifth and sixth trumpet talks about the beast attacking. This is Revelation 9, verses 1 through 12. Okay, the beast attacks, and, it, and this is probably the part where it attacks Iran and scatters them. And then you have the sixth trumpet is the retaliating Asian empires, which is Revelation 9, verse 16. So where they come back at the beast power. And so if we put all this together, then we see the Medes and the Persians, who are the Medes then? It's these peoples of, it looks like Ukraine and Russia, who are getting together with the Iranians and attacking the beast power, which is Europe, but also has planted themselves over in modern day Israel. And so we see all that happening, that the Medes and the Persians are getting back together and attacking the beast power. Now, all that being said, you're going, okay, well, Christ returns. We have Armageddon, which we just talked about recently. Then they come up from Armageddon to Jerusalem to fight. And then, you know, God squashes them all. And you're thinking, okay, God set up his rule. That's good enough. But it's not. In Jeremiah 25, Again, I'll skip through this one a little bit, but put verses 15 through, oh, I had a lot, 38. <laughs> we'll just touch on the uh, some of the significant verses. But this talks about God's judgment on the nations. And I was going to go through and talk about you know, how it was going to happen on a whole bunch of different nations. But let's just skip, skip down to verse 25. And it says, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes are going to reap this, uh, this execution, this judgment. In fact, look at it in verse uh, 15. It says, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, take this wine of cup of fury from my hand and cause all nations to whom I send you to, to drink it. So again, he's bringing down his fury on all these nations. Now, uh, one other verse, 29, says, I will call for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, the other place that we find that phraseology is in Ezekiel 38. Let's go to Ezekiel 38. And we're going to this to put Jeremiah 25 in time context. But Ezekiel 38 and you can put verse 21 for the reference for that verse. So Ezekiel 38 verse 21 says, I will call for a sword. Okay, it's the same exact verbiage that was in Jeremiah 25. I will call for a sword. Okay, well, what's, the, what's this context of, of Ezekiel 38? Well, let's go to, the chap, uh, to verse 1 through 5. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, which is Russia. You can kind of see that there, Rosh, Russia. Meshach, which is Moscow. Tubal, which is Tobolsk. And prophesy against them. So here we are, we're talking about the, the Medes here, right? 
He says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, lead you out with all your army and horses and horsemen, and splendidly clothed a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, verse 5, Ethia and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. So we find the Medes and the Persians are now uh, together. But here's the thing. This is after the return of Christ that they're together. So it seems like the, the Iranians who we're talking about today just won't learn their lesson. Of course, that's not too much of a surprise as we you know, start to get a good flavor in this modern day of technology, whether it's on the web or on TV or what have you, just how the Iranians are behaving. So if you want to put, you put verse 8 and 16 in your notes, and it shows that this is a time in the latter years and in the future. And my point wasn't necessarily to go over all of chapter 38 and 39, which I think a lot of us know and understand to be this post-Christ type of uh, uh, chapters of his return. So, to wrap it up, here we see that Iran is going to continue to act that way. And, and it's no surprise. It's one of the things you know that we talk about in terms of the signs of the times. And this ties exactly into a lot of those types of things. Whenever you see the news and you see what's going on, you see this relationship between the Medes and the Persians happening, between Iran and Russia, and you see the hatred that uh, Iran has for Judah or modern-day state of Israel. You know, right now Iran's having some banking problems. Who do they turn to? Well, Russia. You know, Russia's the part of the BRICS nation, they want their own currency. They want it to be the reserve currency, you know, as the dollar begins to fail. But they look to Russia for help. They need armament. Who do they go to? They go to Russia. Russia gave them some S-300 missiles. And again, it could be, and it's like, I, you know, I hate to go out and say, okay, what does a quiver mean? But, you know, a quiver was full of arrows, and now you have Iran developing all these missiles, which are kind of like arrows. But nonetheless, it can definitely mean some type of weapon. I'm not going to say it's necessarily these missiles, but they're developing these missiles to shoot specifically towards Israel. In fact, uh, Khomeini, the, the latest Ayatollah, the latest leader, and again, understand this too, that in Iran, they have, uh, they're led by, they're a theocracy basically. Even though they have a president, the president is basically appointed by these this group, I think, of six clerics. These six clerics are the ones who tell and dictate everything. Khomeini and Khomeini were both the leading the Ayatollah of the clerics. And they're the ones that they will point the president, and the president goes and does whatever he says to do. But Khomeini just uh, recently came out in a news article and says, U.S. can't do a bleep thing about our missile program, which is you know, great for the leader of a, a theocracy to be cussing and talking about what he's going to do. But... Iran had tested some ballistic missiles, and on the ballistic missiles they wrote, Israel must be wiped off the earth. So the point of all these things in terms of looking at Iran, Iran and understanding who and what they are and what they're going to do, we start seeing and we're watching and praying about the end times, and we see these things coming together. So I think what we need to do is continue to watch for these signs of the times, and to see, and it tells us, and these things begin to put us exactly where we are. It's just yet another thing that shows us that we are indeed in the end time.